Please have a seat, everybody. Half of uh, the federal judges here in the Western District of New York, and we are one of 94 federal districts in the country, probably ranking in the seventh to the tenth most busy uh, district in the United States. Uh, and we're very proud of uh, the fact that we are a very collegial court. Uh, we're a court that's very committed to the full and fair administration of justice. Uh, I think it's a terrific morning to be here. And in particular, uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues whom you see before you, and I will introduce them in just a little bit, uh, on their behalf, I want to welcome you here to the Robert H. Jackson uh, United States Courthouse, and I'm sure that Greg Peterson has um, explained to you uh, a little bit of the background in terms of the naming of uh, our, our courthouse. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to today's program and having you here in particular. I mean, you don't know how much this means to us to have you here, and I, I hope you find this program as interesting uh, today as we think you will. And then, obviously, after the formal presentations, we, we will have our luncheon discussions, and I think you will enjoy, the, enjoy those as well. Uh, we're very proud as federal judges and uh, in this court to really co-host uh, uh, with the American Board of Trial Advocates, or ABOTA, as it is better known in legal circles, uh, this fourth annual James Otis Lecture to commemorate and recognize Constitution Day. It was on September 17th, and I'm sure you all now know this, uh, 1787, that the founders of our great nation, 39 state delegates, voted to approve the draft of our United States Constitution. And what an important day today is. Our Constitution, 4,543 words of it, are inscribed in the curtain wall entrance on the pavilion downstairs as you enter the courthouse. You've probably seen that. And it's there seven times over. So if you think you can memorize something by reading it seven times, the Constitution is there for you to do that. Uh, the, the document itself, it's really an interesting document. It's a living document, but it's also an imperfect document get document. It's the product of hard-fought compromises that were reached over the course of several summer months of debates in Philadelphia. It is also a changing and changeable document. There are, as you probably already know, 27 amendments to our federal constitution. And it is the series of compromises that give our constitution, that document, its persevering power. So on this day, some 230 years after the signing, we celebrate it with today's program. And what's the topic today? Protesting constitutional change. Think about that. Protesting constitutional change. Something that probably you're a part of almost every day, uh, or at least something uh, about that topic you hear about almost every day. Our focus will be the First Amendment. And that First Amendment states as follows, and I'm going to quote it. Congress shall have no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to a petition the government for a redress of grievance. It can be dumbed down and it can be simplified a little bit, but it's critical, critical to what our nation is all about. Free peace, speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of a religion, freedom of press, all encompassed in this First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Specifically, we celebrate and consider the guarantees and the limits of the right to protest and we do it in a building named after Justice Robert H. Jackson, who once wrote of the majestic generalities of the Bill of Rights. But today, we will consider the Constitution and the First Amendment on a more familiar, personal level for us all. 
For example, recently, Colin Kaepernick's refusal to stand for the national anthem, Black Lives Matter, and the manner in which they move their point to the forefront of consideration in our country. Matters like flag burning and the like all are encompassed. What amendment? First Amendment. This First Amendment topic happens to be quite a personal one for me. 1969 was the year I graduated from Howard University Law School. That year, uh, among many other things that happened on campus, students took over the law school, demanding changes to the curriculum and administration. Although I, as a student, sympathized with the protesters in many of their demands, I happened to be one of only a handful of white students on a predominantly black campus at that time. Not only on that one occasion that I referred to was I <clears throat> the subject to a chant, hell no, whitey must go, but on that occasion, I needed an escort from campus on that occasion to ensure my safety. So as you can see, the poignancy of that experience in connection with our topic here today. This is what the laws around protest seek to establish, the right of legitimate expression, which can be an effective engine for change, but not the right to put others in danger. That personal experience of mind and others that were like it while I was in law school, including, including being there when the protests were taking place after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. All of those had a real impact on me. It made, for me, the application of constitutional principles real and not abstract. I'm anxious to hear from our honored guests and our speakers and to get your input and your thoughts about what's going on in your world, in our world today. I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts, if I may. Um, you know, I, I think you can appreciate how critical and how important this topic involving assembly and speech and expression in the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment is or slash are. Uh, you know, our objective was to give you a little bit of a practical, a little bit of a, a manual approach to what you can do and perhaps not do when it comes to protesting and making that decision to protest, uh, the how and why of, of doing that. Uh, you know, I suggest to you this, that you now know how, uh, what you should be doing next is if you decide that there is something that moves you to protest, that you become knowledgeable as to why. Make an effort to study, make an effort to think, make a conscious, intelligent decision on what you hope to accomplish. If you follow the media accounts sometimes, I think it's very embarrassing to see individuals that are out there protesting and when they're asked why, they don't know why. They're caught up in the movement, so to speak, but you don't accomplish things by not knowing why. You don't accomplish things by not working hard to become knowledgeable in the ultimate objective that you have for being where protesting might be taking place or why you are organizing matters. You have to have an open mind in terms of what is the real issue. If I can leave you with a couple of thoughts, I. I, I would like to do that. And from my standpoint, uh, the issue of race, that's not what is the root or what's wrong with America. From my standpoint, the issue of race is what makes America great. America is what you see here in this particular courtroom. America can only be better, be better if we, to 
together want in trying to make it better. What does that take? That means you have to make a commitment to not accepting the status quo. You have to question the status quo. You have to understand what will make the status quo better. I mean, Lee Coppola, uh, I mean, you couldn't have done any better in terms of bringing reality uh, to all of us and maybe inspiring us to think through a little bit better and a little bit more profound these key issues that are simple in many respects. But the more knowledgeable we become, the more likely we'll be, or more unlikely that it will be, that we'll be taken down the wrong path. We want to do what's right. We don't want to do what's wrong. And challenging the status quo is one of the ways that we can make America a better place for ourselves, for our family. Uh, and that's critically important. Uh, you know, I hope that you feel as I do today, that you're going to want to learn more and do more and make a commitment to contribute to what America is all about and consider race as the inspiration for questioning the status quo but not for depressing your efforts, but for inspiring your efforts. I hope today's program has made as significant an impact on you that I, th I think it has on me. We're never too old, despite what Judge Scott said about my being there when the Constitution was written. I still learn things every day. And today was, uh, th thank you, Judge Fascio, yes. <laughs> yeah, same hairdo. No, the, bar the barber is no longer around. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's just so much uh, that we can take out of a program like today. Think a little bit. We're going to start lunch soon. But think about what issues this brought to your mind, what you might, what questions you might have that have been unanswered. And all of us, my colleagues here and, uh, from federal court and our wonderful, wonderful city judges and all of our experts that we've brought in for today. We want to work with you because it's you and your fresh ideas and your understanding of the Constitution that will make us better. Hopefully we can help you leap over a couple of steps so that it doesn't take you as long to understand what the Constitution is all about. Hopefully we can help you just as you help us and then we can continue that uh, from generation to generation to generation. So thank you, Aboda. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you, faculty and administration. Thank you, Mila. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for participating. We'll see you at lunch. Thank you.